Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another Commander 99 podcast episode that we have here for you today. I'm Austin. I'm Jonathan. And today we're going to be talking about Commander in the year 2019. It's going to be a retrospective, kind of looking back to previous sets throughout the year, and we're going to uh, go in a descending order. So we're going to start with Throne of Eldorain, which is going to be the first one uh, that we're going to talk about here. So that was released in October. Yes, um, we're going to talk about a little bit what we liked, what we may have not liked. Yeah, yeah, just kind of looking back as uh, from our experiences in Commander, kind of, you know, bringing up various uh, various cards that we thought were worth mentioning throughout the throughout each set as we go through them. Uh, so Throne of Eldorain, let's start there. All right. Uh, the first thing I wanted to mention was the Brawl Precons, because it is a supplemental commander-type product. Yes. Um, I I would agree. Commander-like product. Right. Well, because you get a legendary creature. Okay. It gave us four legendary creatures, four creatures that all had pretty unique and powerful abilities. Yeah, I like that... Um... They are trying to cater more towards the commander players now. Particularly the Brawl Precons act as this gateway for standard players to get introduced into commander. So yeah, for those that aren't familiar, um, the the four legendary creatures that we're talking about are Alayla, Artful Provocateur, uh, Chulain, Teller of Tales, Corvald, Fae Curse King, and Sir Gwen, Hero of Ashvale. So Alayla was about when you cast an artifact or enchantment, you made a fairy token. Chulain dealt with creatures to draw you cards, to put lands into play. Corvald said sacrificing permanence got you. Card draw as well as plus one, plus one counters. And and Sir Gwen was a a knight tribal deck. And so that was kind of the the focus of each one of the decks is that they kind of each did something unique in their own uh, color variants. And then each deck came with an arcane signet. Uh, and then a couple of them came with uh, Tome of Legend, which... Um... Yes, we were talking about this earlier. I'm not generally a big fan of this card. So it enters the battlefield with a page counter on it. Mm-hmm. It's a two-cost artifact. And whenever your commander enters the battlefield or attacks, um, you get to put another page counter on it. And right. you one and tap it to draw a card. The the one activation is kind of where I, f- I find it to be a little lacking, but the... Being able to draw extra cards from whenever your commander enters the play, I feel like it really lends well to the format with when there's a commander that costs you three mana or less, anything like that. I would say four or less, but yeah, I wouldn't say this is a staple. Let's like go ahead and just, oh, throw this in like another card that we got. Yeah, that was kind of the conversation that was had with Arcane Signet too. That when it was previewed and it was talked about, it was being this this very powerful mana rock, you know, uh, almost on par with Soul Ring in regards to being able to add mana to your mana pool equal to your commander's color identity. It's a it's a command tower on on a, on a mana rock, and we kind of needed something like this for a while. Yes. No. I do hope they reprint more of those in the future. Yeah, that's one of the things. Like, I'd love to see in future Commander products. As far as the rest of the Throne of Eldorain, we had some other cards come into the mix. Like, they they introduced us to a bunch of monocolored legends. Yes. Um, and so the commanders that come out of there were were pretty exciting. I mean, you had some experience uh, with, with Emery. Yeah, I I loved Emery, um, Lurker of the Lost. It's a um, it's an artifact build. She costs mm-hmm. two and a blue. Right. And whenever she enters the battlefield, you mill the top four cards right. of yourself. And then she has a tap ability that lets you cast any artifact from your graveyard, which is great. I just think she was a little too easy to combo with, even when you don't try. Yeah. It's She's a little strong, and people tend to think when you're playing her, Right. That you're just going for those easy combos because it is really easy to combo with. She's a really good commander. I had a lot of fun with her. I comboed some when I didn't mean to. Mm-hmm. But other than that, I had fun. It's just, it's a great deck. It lets you keep on cycling through, drawing a whole bunch of cards, and keep on playing stuff in your graveyard. Right. 
a lot of value from that that legend and i definitely had some experience myself with sir Kara the the bold that was one of where that commander uh, it's a legendary for three colorless and and uh two red where whenever you tap it you get to exile the top card of your library by dealing one damage or whenever you cast an instance or sorcery you can uh exile the top card of your library and then cast it that turn and so it added a lot of value for that from that set yeah it goes great with um uh torbran yeah right uh which is also in this set the throne of red fall mm-hmm. fell which uh when we played that it really went off like yeah more than once when we had our games so i'm glad that they're adding really strong mono color commanders definitely and there, there are definitely some other cards that needed to help monocolored decks. I mean, Herald, Heraldic Banner is one that I find very interesting because I, I like any type of aura effect that gives you an extra power boost. Heraldic Banner says uh, when it enters the battlefield, you choose a color, and then creatures of the chosen color get plus one, plus oh. Which is, and it's also a mana rock, so it taps for a mana of that chosen color. It adds to the deck pretty well uh, for any monocolored deck. I don't know. It's good. I enjoy it. Some other interesting cards that came out of the set were the uh, the lands, the the cycle of two different lands that you could play. What do you think about this? I like that you can fetch for the, the swamps, the islands, and everything yeah, like the, the common ones, the Mystic Sanctuary, and everything like that. Right. I think they're really strong. I really like those a lot. Yeah, I enjoyed them, especially in a monocolor deck. The Mystic Sanctuary and and Witch's Cottage they acted as a you know if you have three or more of the same land type, so island or swamp, uh, you could access those and be able to get you know them untapped easily. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's great because you're adding a lot of tools mm-hmm. without really taking anything out. Yeah, lands add a, a, a very high level of utility to a deck, and I think that's that's something that, in regards to mono colors, that's that lended very well. I I hope they do print some more of these in the future, because you're you don't want to compromise your deck at all. Mm-hmm. Right. And adding another island in there that you can fetch for, yeah, isn't really compromising anything. You're just taking out a basic for it. Correct. The other thing is that there was a cycle of legendary artifacts that can go into decks. Uh, we kind of wanted to bring up a couple examples of ones that, that we felt were a bit uh, above the curve, which is uh, Cauldron of Eternity and and the Great Henge as being cards that really stood out in regards to this set and monocolor decks uh, in particular. The Great Henge is starting to be one of those cards where if my commander has a certain power, like at least five, I'm going to put it in. I think it should go in pretty much every mono green deck. Yeah. Um, I would put the Great Henge in. I could say Cauldron of Eternity. I would not put that in every mono black deck. Yeah. But I think the Great Henge will become a staple of mono green decks, maybe even some two color decks with green in it, mm-hmm. because that card is just really good. Yeah. Well, as long as a creature has a high enough power, you know, if you're going wide as well as tall, you can kind of utilize its ability. I mean, even if it costs six mana, it's on par, it's it's above, you know, a Harvester of Souls, for example, that, you know, you get to not only produce two mana with the Great Henge, uh, you also gain two life, and then whenever a non-token creature enters the battlefield under your control, you put a plus one, plus one counter on it and draw a card. So that's that's a, a much better harvester of souls, and and the the converted mana cost gets reduced by a creature's power you control. So if you have, let's say you even had a harvester of souls out, you would it would become a three mana uh, great henge. And then it's just a plus two. Right. You draw two every time you do a creature. Exactly. Uh, really good card. Yeah. The real card I wanted to talk about here, in, in particular from the set, was Oko Thief of Crowns. <clears throat> That card uh, kind of made its way through mo- most of the uh, the other formats. I mean, it, it seen ban in Pioneer, Historic, and Standard currently. Modern. It is really strong. Um, uh, and 
for those of those who don't already know what Oko does, it's a colorless, a green, and a blue for a planeswalker that uh, comes in with four loyalty, and for its plus two, you can create a food token. A food token can be uh, sacrificed for two mana to gain you three life. The other ability is to create... Uh, to make a target artifact or creature lose all its abilities and become an elk with a base power and toughness 3-3. Three, three. And so those two abilities alone allow you to kind of keep it around for a while because they're both plus abilities. So Oko doesn't leave the battlefield uh, very easily. It's used mostly for its plus one. Yeah. Um, it's removal on a stick. Well, I think that's why, why we would use it in, in Commander because, you know, f you start at 40 life as opposed to, to any of the other formats. You're not in a 1v1, so, you know, the gaining three life from the food token isn't going to be as relevant as the turning your opponent's Commander into an elk. Just not even Commander, just any artifact or creature. Right. It's just so versatile. Mm-hmm that not many removal spells this is a great removal spell especially if it even yeah. goes around to you twice yeah you could have pretty much removed two things for three mana if you're playing in those simic colors you definitely want to include this in any commander deck i think uh and we thought we wanted to mention that in terms of commander because you know you don't hear it talked about very often uh in that format it's more about how powerful it is in every other format Okay, um, I think that's pretty much it for Throne of Eldraine. So why don't we move on ahead uh, to Commander 2019? What do you What do you think? I like mostly in the a Johnny one, Falcon Wrath. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Falcon Wrath and a Anya. Anya, Anya sorry, Anya, Anya yeah. Falcon Wrath, and the Mono Black, the Son of Yagma. Okay. I think those were two of the strongest of the of, of the set of the set of the the commander because in in August of 2019 they released uh, like their annual commander product and so we had four pre-constructed decks all built around particular themes you had madness as the Rakdos commander you had your Jeskai flashback you had your Soltai morph. And then you had uh, the the last one was Naya Populate. Yes. And so each one was built around a particular theme, and and this one kind of felt like it gave us some versatility in terms of like legendary creatures for sure. You had access to a bit more of a, a card pool. Like I think one of the things that they really put a big point around with these ones was giving you more reprints. Because I think the previous year, people didn't see enough reprints. There weren't enough cards of like value that they wanted out of the decks. Like Commander 2018, I felt like everyone was kind of, you know, down on that they didn't really get enough out of. And I think this kind of like elevated that. Like it kind of brought us back to a bit of a, a higher level, you know, in terms of power and the the variety of legendary creatures. Yeah. No, the power was definitely stronger. Um everyone appreciated the reprints um we hope they do more in the future because there are a ton of cards that are really overpriced mm -hmm. that shouldn't be just because they were printed so long ago yeah from the from the commander products from the commander products that they're reprinting and we're liking that they're doing more of it even right. in some of their specialty products and everything well i remember from my experience from playing with these one of the things we ran into is like straight out of the box these decks were very uh they had plenty of uh removal plenty of control yes so mm. games would last several hours more than most commanders yes they're more yeah these were definitely one of the like the, the later game pre-constructed decks let's board wipe a few times and yeah. see what happens kind of thing right uh i think i was definitely surprised a bit by the populate deck in particular uh i remember when the the legendary creature the face card was geared was was announced you know i i definitely enjoyed the ability to populate by attacking with it mm -hmm. and then i felt 
a bit more drawn to the supplemental commanders that came into the product. So Atla Palani Nest Tender, which uh, if you're not familiar, when it when an egg you control dies, you reveal the top card of your library until you reveal a creature card and put that creature onto the battlefield. It taps for two colorless and creates a green egg creature token. And so this was uh, tribal eggs where you spin the wheel and, and put out a big creature, hopefully. Um, the way I w- built it was I focused very heavily on the uh, using sacrifice outlets to get exactly what you wanted. So while you put like only five or six re- really good creatures in the deck, the rest of it was X to be able to redraw and continue to do the effect as long as you had a, uh, any kind of sacrifice outlet. Uh, really good how you build it and mm-hmm. um, it can go multiple ways it could go like you built it throwing some sun titan into right. there and just keep on trying to abuse your eggs and yeah everything or you can just build it with big dumb creatures and just try to trample over everyone yeah yeah uh we've actually seen uh marisi breaker of coil played a few times in our group uh it is much better than i thought it would be because of effects that allow you to get in for commander damage like creatures with shadow or just the fact that marisi is a 5-4 um for four mana it's easily able to get in and uh you know have no combat tricks yeah and goading each creature is really strong yeah especially when you have some unblockable people so you can attack two of your opponents Right. It's like you're, you're put in a scenario where two players have creatures and maybe the other one doesn't because they're playing more of a spell slinger control deck. And so they can't activate spells during, during combat and you're forcing the other two to kind of fight it out amongst themselves. As far as some of the other decks are concerned, uh, what were your thoughts on the morph Sultai deck? Um, when we were talking about this on one of our videos with Reed, I agree with him. Morph should have been five colors. Yeah. Um, I think just a morph deck should be five colors in general. That is the only real complaint I had about this deck. It's uh, really strong, lets you play the the first face down, the first morph pretty right. much for free. And then whenever you, whenever a face down creature enters the battlefield, you get to draw a card. Right. So that doesn't even need necessarily be with morphs or anything. It's just, it's really strong. I've definitely seen this deck explode. You know, I've played it a few times where you can, you know, use enough cost reduction to reduce all your morphs to zero and then play a morph, you know, have some other effect out on the board like Guardian Project where between those two you're able to play a morph and draw two cards. And then you just continually chain morphs together until you have a board full of two twos, which isn't... Really? isn't awful <laughs> yeah. it's just yeah it's it's a fun deck to play mm-hmm. i don't think it's like oh you need to there's a lot kill of that value morph guy it. yeah yeah but it doesn't necessarily add uh what morphs want to do which flip face up you know yeah like that's something you need your mana to and maybe if we had more effects that untapped your lands that could allow you to do that that would add some because i've seen uh what is it you have Animar, Soul of the Elements, was kind of the face morph commander before this deck came out. And it was, you know, Reed played it where you were able to reduce the cost of your morphs so you didn't need mana to cast any So you just any played them for free. Correct. You get to play the first for free, for free, but then you want to be able to just keep casting your morphs to draw cards, and then you don't have enough mana to flip your morphs up. So you need more effects that untap your lands, I think, to to really thrive with this deck. Yeah. Like it's a fun deck to play, gets you a lot of value mm-hmm. and everything, but that's about that's about it. You're gonna kind of slow unless you put some haste enables in there, like a Concordia Crossroads or something. Right. And costs a lot of mana. Yeah. You, I think, had mo- the most experience with the Jeskai deck uh, out of all of us. Yes. Um, I built Pramicon two ways, mm-hmm. um, online, I really like building enchantments just because they're really hard to deal with. Right. I think that's probably my favorite archetype to build. Okay. Is enchantments. Yeah. Just you get so much value out of them, and people don't really have a lot of ways to remove them. So I built Pramicon enchantments. Mm-hmm. Um, if you guys do play Pramicon on Moto, it is very confusing on. Um, the turn order. Yeah. 
on the turn order. Right. I remember the first time I played it, I was uh, looking at my screen. Um, I thought right was left, and that didn't really work out for me. Yeah. But other than that, I think it's a, a very fun commander. I mean, right out of the box, uh, Savine was kind of the face card of this flashback uh, style deck. And I kind of felt myself gravitating towards the other commanders in the deck, the other legends, as opposed to playing Savine, because there was just a bit more support for what they wanted to do. You know, they had a lot more value out of them than, than say, Savine, like... The, the flashback effects and any time of grape any type of grape graveyard effects you kind of like found yourself like paying way much more mana than you would have if you just cast the spells from your hand and a lot of them are sorceries um yeah. i would have loved to see um flashback cards have flash right a little weird to see on a card mm-hmm. but i feel like savine was missing something yeah just a little just that little extra to make it like a really good commander yeah like she's okay in my opinion right now but it's just most of the flashbacks that you want to play are sorceries Mm -hmm. and then you don't you'd need to throw some creatures in or some other cards to make you have flash it's when you really want to do stuff is on the end of people's turns yeah I, i i can get that um the last one was we kind of talked a little bit about it it was anya anya folk and wrath um i wanted to mention specifically that that was the one i had had my first experience with i kind of wanted to build anya before before the set even came out that that was the one i was looking to build the most and i i put together a list and went to the command uh the command zone area at magic fest las vegas and they gave you a commander pre-constructed deck i got my hands on the anya folk and wrath uh madness deck and built that deck from the box and uh i had a lot of fun with it it is very fast i know that a lot of people want to build combo with it but in reality there is a level of combo potential when you are able to discard so many madness cards to cycle through i'd say at least 40 cards of your deck easily when you're playing a game yeah yeah by turn like five six you were usually deep into your deck right and it's something that like the madness uh, mechanic is supposed to be where when you discard the cards you're able to activate their abilities and and pay their mana costs in order to be able to recast them the way that i built this deck in particular was i focused just putting the cards in the graveyard creatures specifically and using an effect like living death or twilight's call in order to bring all of those you know low powered creatures back onto the battlefield uh, without my opponents gaining much of an advantage and just swinging for you know an obscene amount of damage yeah um out of all the builds that i've seen this the build that you had the one that just kind of dumps the creatures in yeah has the most sustainability right yeah i i think they that we got some good legendaries out of that we got some good themes i mean there were a couple key cards that we wanted to highlight from it particularly dockside extortionist being the 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 biggest one from that dockside extortionist says when it enters the battlefield create x treasure where x is the number of enchantments and artifacts that your opponents control uh and it only costs two mana to cast dockside extortionist one in a red can, one, yeah can can we say best card in the set yeah it was definitely the most highly anticipated too the second it was previewed everyone would talk about it as like being the best card and i think for commander for me at least i felt that it kind of like it it holds a high spot i don't think it's necessarily game winning on its own no it's just very strong like yeah, strong mono red value we were playing a few days ago and i kept a one land hand because i had dockside right that that's how strong it was one land a soul ring um dockside and a burnished heart yeah, because kind of a lot thing. of a lot of your opponents are going to be playing mana ramp, mana rocks yeah, on turns one and one and two, and so you get out of dockside and you've you've gained a net positive of six mana to use at any point. Yeah, it's not a card that you hold in your hand and you're like, "Wow, I don't need this." It's yeah. pretty much viable 
throughout the whole game because when can't you use extra mana for the most part right uh another one i wanted to mention was the oran frost fang so i felt this one was was pretty interesting for for green strategies because you don't really see green focusing too heavily on being able to gain advantages from combat while it you know focuses heavily on combat a card like this allows you to uh draw some cards so oran frost frost fang is three colorless and two green attacking creatures you control have death touch and whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player draw a card so basically you are allowed to go shields down and draw a bunch of cards i mean green has been getting a lot of card draw lately which is great yeah you yeah know. next uh white just needs it right white could use some more card draw but we'll we'll get there eventually i think there will be be other ways for white to gain advantages you know like red has impulsive draw and and black usually you know you have to pay a resource in order to get the, your card draw by sacrificing creatures taxes um, mono green has been getting like this uh, you know insane amount of card draw from you know commander products i mean there's another card that came out of the same product voice of many entering the battlefield causes you to draw a card for each opponent that controls fewer creatures than you so that's another way to draw cards from that deck um i felt like it just it it seemed really good i was i was definitely interested in those cards me not so much i mean i could see playing a voice of many i think the um frost fang costs a little too much for my taste Mm. but that's just me gotcha well, would you see yourself playing like Bone Miser, for example? Same amount of mana, five mana for Bone Miser. Yes, um, in certain builds, I would play Bone Miser. Yeah. I think it's. Uh, well, it's in any discard strategy. I mean, I play it in in Anya Falcon Wrath. Yeah, well, it's four and a black. It's a four four. Whenever you discard a creature card, create a two two black zombie creature token, mm-hmm. and then when you discard a land card, add two black. Right. Like that's good especially in Anya yeah uh it definitely it's it's waste not on a creature which is fun you know uh another card is Mire and Misery which gave Black the opportunity to sacrifice creatures and sacrifice enchantments you know you don't see much I I really like um like that card only because Black has so much creature destruction as it is Mm -hmm it's really easy for them to get creatures off the board and it kind of gave them a way to deal with enchantments right because most people don't load up on enchantments they're playing one or two enchantments so this what's the odds of them having them out at the same time yeah especially in those early turns um i like that it's a three for one so you get each opponent to sacrifice a creature or enchantment so for two mana you know a lot of the times people are gonna sacrifice their least favorite creature but if you get it in those early turns like you know each person casts their commander or cast an enchantment that you don't like uh early on in the game you can really respond with a nice mire and misery or even in the later turns black has so many board wipes Mm -hmm. right so you just board wipe and then then get rid of their enchantments make everyone sacrifice an enchantment uh another thing that these pre-cons added to or the new commander product added to the game is uh more effects that commanders uh and that interact with your commander Uh, i wanted to bring this particular topic up because commander cards like this one they lend more towards a strategy that i'm hopefully trying to work towards eventually is it not ever having to pay commander tax well it's (laughs) commander it's a commander commander themed deck okay and so every card interacts with your commander in some way i think you have a little little ways to go there yeah we're getting we're getting close i mean these this one offered a few more cards to that effect i think like if you build a four color deck using two partner commanders you can really take advantage of some of these commander effects like commander insignia uh, insignia for two colorless and and two white creatures you control get plus one plus one for each time you've cast your commander uh from your command zone this game and so that includes partner commanders 
Yes. Yes, it does. Right. And so that's one of those effects. Like, if you're playing a, a white deck that has a commander that, say, costs two mana, then this is a, a card that you can include. I've I've seen, you know, similar effects like this, like the Cathar's Crusade, which works, you know, much stronger with whenever a creature enters the battlefield, but it's still along that lines. All you need is a three power boost, really. Yeah, I'm more of a fan of like a uh, road to return. Okay. Um, to choose one, return target permanent card from your graveyard to your hand. But I like the second option. Right. Uh, put your commander into your hand from your command zone. It also has entwine, so you can pay two and two green and do both of them. Yeah. But. Have you ever cast your commander too many times? Yeah, I mean, that's, and you just feel bad casting him again. That's why Command Beacon is is currently at at the price point that it is. It it's a very sought after card. You know, putting your commander from your command zone into your hand is is a really good ability to be able to you know not have to pay that extra tax. I mean, that's why I like Myth Unbound so much because it reduces the cost of your commander for each time it was cast, and then draws you cards on top of that. It's it's another effect that works really well with with your commander, and so I'm just I'm waiting for them to print more. Let's Hope, Commander oh. 2020 <laughs> get some more effects like this. Hopefully please. they'll print more <laughs> cost reduction of a uh, command like a uh, tax. Yeah, command. Hopefully tax. they'll print reprint more cost reduction. Perfect. Count me in. Uh, okay, so next up we're talking about Corset 2020, which that was a set that was released. Uh, Right before, right before Commander 2019, so it went, you know, Commander 2019 came out uh, after 2020. Uh, that's one thing that always comes up when a new set, when it comes to that summertime uh, release. But this one was also based around previous, like, Commander themes, Commander products. This one had a lot stronger legendaries than i thought it was going to being a core set right yeah for a core set it had very powerful legends being um (laughs) off the top top of my head golos uh tireless pilgrim yeah um yeah um (laughs) what to say about that card well you in particular had some like a lot of experience with mazes end decks and i think golos came out and it was it fit perfectly because before maze's end you know you didn't really have a commander that got you lands or no. got you value no like this one does. so golos is technically a uh, five color commander correct it costs just five colorless mana or any color to cast it right. when you cast them you search for a land put it onto the battlefield tapped mm-hmm. and then he also has another ability for two and wooberg to exile the top three cards of your library, you may play them this turn without paying their mana cost. Yeah. That is the build that everyone tended to build around with Golos. Yeah, to focus on that activated ability to get just a ton of value. And that's what made him really strong. You right. could fill your deck with just a whole bunch of strong spells and not really have to worry about how are you going to cast them because you can cast Golos and then you can pretty much just activate them once or twice right depending on what you put yeah and i think like a lot of the legends that came out of this set added a lot of value to the command zone like it, it, you got something for having a commander something extra that the deck lended to like we have kaikar winds fury kethis the hidden hand omnath locus of royal yarok the Des- desecrated and then uh kalia where they all kind of gave you something for the for being on the battlefield some kind of like added bonus for playing them as your commander which was really nice to see them lend the corset to focus so heavily on your legendary creatures like this yeah yeah i like how uh actually no the even the hydra one is great right um well, yeah, Hydra Tribal is a lot of fun. Um, it's fun. Safara yeah. Skyblade would focus very heavily on on flying. Like it was a flying tribal deck. I think they they had this set had a lot of good legendary creatures, and a lot of standard sets recently have had a high level of creatures that you can play that that lend well to a new strategy. 
Yeah. Again, I was just surprised they had so many good options. Yeah. In this set. Definitely. That's all. It was it was a very nice surprise. Yeah, and there were definitely some good cards in the set as well. Um, we had particularly the Cavalier cycle that each one of the Cavaliers kind of did something, you know, something very powerful for Commander, you know, being able to get two abilities off of a single card, I think is what makes it great. Uh, I definitely enjoyed those cards in particular. Yeah, then you have uh, cards like Field of the Dead. Right. I'm sure everyone knows what that does. Yeah, that card came from Standard and 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 Pioneer, I believe. It got banned uh, in Pioneer. Yes, Standard and Pioneer. Yeah, just a very strong card. Um, don't play it turn one and Commander. Right. Um, just because pretty much Commander, you will always have those land types. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're playing either at least a two or three color deck, and then you've got. Mm. The ability to play you don't even need to be playing a lands matter deck to play field of the dead it's just really good just yeah let's make some zombies whenever i play a land exactly it's it's a landfall land ability that just it, it's very it's it's it highlights itself very well and lends to your commander decks because of the whole being able to play you know so many different lands with different land names that you're able to fulfill its requirements easily and then put in a landfall deck it just kind of goes crazy yeah exactly you you start putting out you know you you activate scape shift you sacrifice all your other lands put out a bunch of other lands and then you've got 22 two zombies to deal with because of a an onboard ability not even yeah. not even any effect uh, from other any other card in your hand it's so uh, good it is it's a lot of fun so we thought we'd mention those cards in particular from the set as a way to kind of you know give you uh, uh some of our our favorite highlights from from corset 2020 we talked about all the legendary creatures that came out of corset 2020 we <clears throat> talked about all the legendary creatures that came out of commander 2019 uh this episode we want to kind of break up into two parts so that you can kind of get uh a lot of the information because there's a lot to cover throughout the year and so we'll be picking it up next week with the uh with the commander bannings back in july um so you'll hear us kind of talk about that and uh uh some of the other sets that came out before that all right uh i'm austin i'm jonathan and we'll we'll see you soon bye